here laughing. I actually have an elder about 15 years ago that struggled with my name and finally she said, can I just call you Darlene? That's way easier. So for the past 15, 20 years, every time I see her, hey Darlene, how you doing? And everybody will look and go, who the heck is she talking to? And I'll go, well me of course, who did you think? So um, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So yes, it has caused me grief throughout my life. My maiden name is Wycott, so I was always at the very back corner of every class that I ever sat in, said in W, how do you like that? Um, how I'm here today, that's what I thought, because some of you are probably going, where did this woman come from, the Shishwap woman, and end up with us? Um, I am a, I have a consulting company called the Xander Ross Leadership Group. And what my main focus is, is community, individual, and organizational growth. So they focus on training, leadership, and, um, and development. They focus on coaching as well, about helping people set individual strategic plans instead of just that overall one. And uh, I'm very excited been doing it for about 20 years. And uh, how I was able to connect with your community is I was able to do some training with your door-to-door -door team. And uh, maybe if any of them see if you could just give me a wave, because I haven't got to do any training with them. So treaty door-to-door -door team, can I give a wave? I just like to give them a big round of applause. Uh, they are a great bunch, and we've got to spend um, a few sessions together, um, really working on making sure that the community is getting all the information. And they're a fantastic group, and I thank them for making me feel so much a part of this community. A um, couple of other things. Um, we just wanted to let you know we've got a parking lot on the side, so if any questions come up, some people aren't uh, as confident about jumping on the mic and saying what they want to say, and, and we really want to respect that. So we've got some post-it notes, and uh, the more information we get, the better we can provide a uh, frequently asked questions list for you and get you the information that you need. So I really encourage you to use the post-it notes. I would also like to uh, give a big round of applause to our caterers for a fantastic meal. Thank you. And uh, a final comment before I introduce our speaker. Um, one of the big things that, uh, that I like to teach and all of the work that I do is about the stages of learning. Um, I started working in my community treaty 20 years ago as an urban office coordinator. And most of the time I felt like I was drinking water from a fire hose. It was just so much, it was so technical and complex. And through all the training and development that I've done, because I used to beat myself up and go, oh, why can't I understand this? I'd also look at other people and go, why aren't they making this easier for me to understand? Then I learned about the stages of learning, and I just wanted to share it with you because once I figured that out, I started going, okay, they're not smarter than me, or I'm not smarter than them. The first stage, and I won't give you all the technical names, the first stage, is, the first stage of learning is, I don't know what I don't know. La la la, I'm living in a happy fog, everything's great in my world because I don't know what I don't know. The second stage is, uh-oh, now I know what I don't know. Uh-oh, that's a lot of information. This is a lot of times where learning will stop because people get so overwhelmed. Um, and, and I watch my, and I've seen it from elders down to my own four and six year old. I don't want to do this anymore, it's too hard. And I say, keep pushing you guys because the third stage comes along and you start going, hey, I think I know what George is talking about. I remember we had it at a meeting. So you start remembering, you start being able to explain it. You also come up with better questions because you know what you're hearing. And then the fourth stage is, I can explain this to other people. I might not be able to give the whole legal description, but I can give you a background on, on what this is all about. And what I tell people, it's kind of like Tide. If anybody walked up, if Tide never had the marketing strategy that they did, you could walk up to somebody and say, do you know what Tide is? And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. But they, they planted the message with us so many times that no matter where you go in the world, you can say Tide and simulate washing clothes and people will know what you mean no matter what corner of this world that you go to. 
I believe it's the same with the messaging from here. We need to hear the message a few times so that our brain can process it and understand it. So I really encourage you to listen with curiosity, um, respect the different knowledge in the room and the levels of learning. Some people, I like to say, we're always in grade one to 12. For me, my knowledge is still at the grade two or three level. There's other people here that are in grade 12. So I really look to you to listen with curiosity and share your knowledge with others. So now I'd like to thank you for that time. I promise I won't, I won't start singing a song here. I feel like doing some karaoke, but we'll leave that for the end of the session, all right? I would like to introduce George Nicholson, who is a, a legal advisor uh, for your community, and he is going to be our keynote speaker. So give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Just be a second. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is George. Uh, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit in terms of uh, what we mean by legal advisor. Uh, I'm currently an articling student, so I've, I've completed my law degree, but uh, I haven't quite. Uh, uh, you do one year of articling before you're officially a lawyer. So I've got a couple months before I'm officially a lawyer. I can't make that right now. Um, I did at least, uh, I worked for quite a while with Aboriginal Affairs in Canada and uh, really didn't like it, please don't hold it against me. Um, very happy to be working for First Nations instead. And um, it did at least give me a chance to learn uh, to, to learn the treaty. I was working in treaty negotiations with them for three years. Uh, worked with the provincial government before that. And happy to uh, be here and try and explain some of the uh, chapters of the EIP as, as plainly as we can. Uh, there's times when admittedly it's a bit of a challenge. There's lots of uh, lots of legal language, lots of um, lots of different issues that can, can be very difficult to simplify sometimes. But we'll do our best. Um, I'd like to start off with some of the harvesting chapters. They're, uh, when I say harvesting, I mean for the most part we're talking hunting, we're talking uh, we're talking gathering, we're talking. Well, we, we would be talking fishing, but, but as, we'll, as we'll see here, we probably already know we are, we're leaving fishing to a large extent for final game in Canada. But, uh, so that's what, what we'll start with. Uh, I know on the agenda item that it says um, uh, that we're talking resources and talking environmental assessment. And we will be talking environmental assessment, but it's really sort of one agenda item uh, that we're looking at. And in this case, we're looking at resources in, in, in the context of the environmental assessment chapter. So. We'll do that one. Uh, we'll do that one after this. This one should be nice and uh, I, I find this one be nice and straightforward. So it's hopefully a good place to start. And then when we uh, we get our brains working, we can tackle environmental assessment, which is a little more complicated. Okay. So in. Um, just in general, in regards to what we mean by harvesting, uh, like I was saying, we're talking for the most part uh, having the right to hunt and having the right to gather in, in your harvest areas. We'll come to uh, we'll come to what your harvest areas are in a couple slides here, but uh, talking about the right to hunt and gather in your harvest area and the right to hunt. Uh, uh, one of the things that we the terminology we rely on is this. Uh, we use this definition of domestic purposes as well. It just means food, social, and ceremonial purposes. Uh, you probably heard of the terms that I've seen before for, for all your salmon. Uh, those words come out of the Sparrow decision. Uh, uh, part, of, part of what it means is it's not, it's not necessarily meant for commercial purposes. It's meant for you to use on your own. But, uh, um, one of the things with Aboriginal rights, they're also a bit reluctant to, to acknowledge commercial, uh, commercial rights. They do it occasionally, but uh, it's been rare. 
So you'll see the you'll see those words domestic purposes if you look at any of those chapters, and that's that's all we mean is it's FSC. Um, you'll see that with each of the three chapters, there's there's a lot of similarities. So there's there's three chapters for the most part that I'm talking about here. The wildlife chapter, which is your right to hunt, uh, just about it anything wild other than birds. The migratory birds chapter, which is uh, obviously about migratory birds and what we, what we mean by migratory birds, of course, is it's not necessarily some of the domestic birds, it's not about uh, chickens and stuff. It's, it's going to be the ones that are flying uh, outside of the province even for the most part. And then, uh, and then the gathering chapter. And in all three you'll see, uh, you'll see certain similarities. And for the most part, we're just going to refer to the wildlife chapter. And I've got a couple of slides in the end where I'll explain the, a couple of differences in, in the gathering chapter and in the migratory birds chapter. So in each of them you have uh, basically three, three limitations uh, that are common in, in regards to your rights to hunt and gather. So the first one is conservation concerns. Uh, anytime that they're worried that a species might be endangered or um, uh, we have an endangered, then they have, the courts, the courts presume even in terms of Aboriginal rights that they have the right to, to limit that. They feel that that's within First Nations interest as well to preserve the species so that future generations can hunt it. Um, and that, uh, that comes pretty much from the Sparrow decision as well. We have, uh, there's another limitation for well, anytime there's any sort of public health concerns, you know, especially for, the, that one may apply better to some of the gathering. Stuff. If you were trying to gather something and, and there was concerns that that was going to create a, a health risk among people, then, uh, then that's considered a, a, a fair limitation. Then uh, we also have public safety concerns. You know, obviously you have the right to hunt, but you have to be safe with the operation of your firearms and such. There was a case, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know the down with it. There's a case uh, that I can remember that applies to this. It was an uh, Aboriginal uh, hunter that was hunting at night. And uh, he was charged for, uh, he was charged, he claimed he had an Aboriginal right. He actually won because he was able to show that he was hunting fairly safely at night. But, but they did say that that would be normally a fair limitation if he wasn't taking some of the precautions that he was to, uh, to ensure the safety. Uh, one of the things you'll see in uh, each of the chapters as well is uh, is an insistence that uh, that your that your rights are a communal right, um, and you'll see this in pretty much the vast majority of the case law. They'll refer to Aboriginal rights as communal rights, and so we have something similar in paragraph five of the Wildlife chapter, for example, that. Um, that it's, it's a communal right, it's meant for the, all, the entire community to enjoy, not necessarily just one individual. Okay, so it's important to understand uh, this notion of the harvest areas. Um, we have the map over there of the treaty settlement lands. You're, you're hunting and gathering and, and eventually you're fishing. Uh, they're not limited to just treaty settlement lands, it's, it's a broader territory. And uh, we've got a map that I'm going to show you, that, that as long as you understand for now, that it's, it's not just treaty settlement lands. We've had to, they've had to leave, you'll see, if you look in the wildlife chapter, for example, you'll see in paragraphs 9 and 11 that they've had to leave some of the details out. And that's in part uh, to uh, give a chance for its family uh, to negotiate some protocol agreements with some of the other First Nations that might be affected by that. Okay, so here is the map that we're working from to start with, at least uh, for the purposes of uh, for the purposes of AIP. And I know it'll probably be very difficult to tell you from where you're sitting, but uh, we'll do our best. Hopefully, you can see. No. The um, so what we're looking at there is the, the entire Simpson uh, statement of intent. The sort of broader, it's, it's hard to tell the color, but it's sort of orange. That's the broader uh, statement of intent, we call it, of all, 
all five first nations that, uh, that we're working together with Caleb and some Caleb. And so basically you've got a little blue portion there that, that's following down the Skeeter River going to the coast there. And that's uh, basically where the negotiators have identified that, that you currently fish, where uh, the negotiators feel that you currently have fishing rights. Like I've already been, we have to uh, we have to negotiate that yet in the final agreement. And then you have uh, a core area that's in red um, that uh, is there's there's not much doubt about it. That was it's in Canada territory, and in, in that area we're confident. Negotiators confident already that uh, that you have rights to hunt and fish. And thank you. That's the Kids and Caleb, what we're referring to as the Kids and Caleb core area. And um, and then the uh, the negotiators are negotiating for the hunting rights throughout the entire the broadest boundary there. But they'll have to work out some details with other First Nations when uh, when they get closer to their core area, so to speak. Which is not to say that they'll have the right to prevent you from hunting uh, in, in all that area, but uh, if they can identify certain core areas to them, then it gets more problematic, admittedly, for it's a camel down there. Okay, so uh, difficult to see the heading in this one says provincial crown land. So, uh, Obviously, within your entire statement of intent, you've got a few different kinds of land. You've got some federal crown land, you've got mostly provincial crown land, and you have uh, some lands that we own by other people, even more often than not, fee simple lands. In terms of provincial crown lands, um, get some Kalo members can hunt or gather on provincial crown lands as long as it doesn't interfere with the, the crown use of the land. And uh, in most cases, Provincial crown land is, is vacant, so there's there's not much interfering. Uh, there's no interference there. It's easy enough to do it. The um, the other point we'll make here is that the provincial government can uh, we admit the, the provincial government can use its crown lands as long as its use of the lands doesn't interfere with Kitsi uh, rights. That's paragraph 12 of the wildlife chapter. I guess these references are all to the wildlife chapter. The uh, paragraph 14 there uh, pretty much uh, comes right out of uh, a decision called the SUI decision. Um, it's spelled out of the regulator if you like it here, just to see. Another thing that's important to understand in the, um, in the, the, the various harvesting chapters is this notion of incidental use. Um, I know the words don't necessarily jump right out at you as to what, what that might entail. And uh, the words come right out of uh, what's it called the Sundown decision. Uh, Mr. Sundown had a, uh, a temporary cabin that he went to, I think it was in northern Quebec, northern Quebec or northern Ontario, where he would go and he would, he would hunt 